Yeah, I think right. that, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, just like some, just some uh, housekeeping stuff. Yes, uh, sir. We'll have a photographer contact you. I, I was thinking about uh, doing something with hats since you're doing like the WIP thing and the Comcast thing and maybe the, a Santa Claus hat in the middle or something. Fine. The, the man of many hats or something along those lines. Um, so, did some research for this and Michael Barkan, date of birth 43060. Correct. Jersey City, New Jersey? Yes. East Brunswick High School? Yes. Wife Ellen? Yes. Syracuse, 1982? Yes. Two kids? Yes. I think we're done. <laughs> That's good. All right. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing it. <laughs> what are the kids' names? Emily right. and, and Matthew. She is how old? She's 15. 15. Interesting age for yes, the daughter. Yes, it is. In fact, I sent her the lyrics as a song. By five for fighting 100 years, you've heard it. It's a popular song about, you know, uh, and, it, and, it, and it goes something like, you know, caught uh, 15, caught in between 10 and 20. Mm -hmm. And five years ago, she was 10. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Ten, tw five years from now, she's going to be 20? You know, you're, you're talking to a man that raised four daughters, yeah. including triplets. So, I mean, it's hard for me to feel sorry for him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's amazing. How old are they now? They're 20. Triplets are 21. Mm -hmm. Ashley's 28. Ashley just got her master's in education. She can't find a teaching job, so she's tending bar. But I think she's making more money tending bar. Yeah, that's seat. the thing, though. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be difficult. You got the cash, especially it comes... It's hard yeah. to walk away from it today. And your son's name? Matthew. And how old is Matthew? He's 11. Okay. That's a great age. It is. He's okay. a sweet boy. You, um, you, you got started in the business at, at NBC Affiliate in Washington, is that right? Yeah, I graduated Syracuse in 82, and um, I moved down to D.C. My girlfriend at the time um, was living down there, and then she uh, I worked that summer for NBC News as a news assistant, and uh, I thought I'll, uh, I'll be the first news assistant to work his way up to network correspondent. And then, uh, you know, I realized that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so, and then she took her final semester abroad, so I was in D.C. by myself, <clears throat> And I moved back home with my folks, Central New Jersey, East Brunswick, and and uh, I'm I'm watching um, New Jersey Network News one night, and I said, Oh my gosh, there's a there's a local newscast in New Jersey. I'm in, so I I wrote to their news director, and I got an interview, and they hired me as basically doing the same thing I was doing in D.C. except unlike at NBC, I could do other things there. I could I could write stories. I could go out on interviews, um, and that's what I did. Which none of which I could do at at, at network because it's all union and you can't do this and you can't hold a microphone. You, so, a New Jersey network is like just roll up your sleeves, and let's do it. Right. So I would I would go out and interview politicians. We were based in in Lawrenceville, uh, Lawrence, uh, Newing, New Jersey. And, but it was one town over from Trenton. I'd, I'd go into into Trenton and interview anyone from the from the governor to you know state assemblymen or state senators, women, mm -hmm. and um, and wasn't there, stuff weather, wasn't there a weather situation that kind of forced you on the air? Were, were you mm -hmm. working behind the scenes at one? Well, point that's what I tell it? kids. I'm like, you know what? Uh, there's the old line: dress for the job you want. And I would always come to work dressed in a shirt and tie and a jacket and nice trousers. And, and, um, just the case, right? Yeah. Just also, but that's just the way I, I was brought up, you know? And, and, um, I remember going to, going into New York for an, uh, an interview for Syracuse in, at their alumni house. My father was a long time advertising man, uh, automotive advertising. He was at Doyle Dane Burnback at the time. And, uh, so I met him and we were going to go home afterward. And I, I sat, I sat down, I had my suit on, I'd just come back from the interview, and he was talking to a colleague in his office, and he introduced me, I sat down, he said, how was the day? I said, good, and I started out losing my tie, he said, we're not home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyway, so it was from that that I, I, I would always wear, I would always wear a jacket and tie, suit and tie sometimes, and, and then I would write, uh, there was no weatherman in the newscast, and I would write the, uh, I would write the weather cast for the anchors to read. North Jersey, Central Jersey, South Jersey, and I'd write the forecast and they'd read it. And then one day, February of 1983, so I'm out of, I'm out of school for, what, eight months or something like that, and um, <clears throat> I, uh, th there was a blizzard. We got a blizzard. They said, well, weather's the, weather's the lead. 
and uh, we don't have a weather guy. And they looked at me and they said, I wrote the weather every day. You do it? So, I, you know, I changed my shorts. And I said, I said, I called my, I'm going to be hot tonight. And, um, That's awesome. yeah, so I did it. It was yeah. the most embarrassing thing, you know. My wife used to pull out the tape. Yeah, you want to take out the garbage, Mr. Fancy? Huh? Take a look at that. You're not so hot. <laughs> yeah, somewhere. Um, and so, so then I started doing a show called Weather Watch, which was in, in programming, you know, like 6.58 and 7.28. Then they decided to put weather in the newscast. And uh, so I did that for a while. Uh, and then they said uh, they fired the number one sports guy. And they made the number two guy the number one guy. So they needed a number two sports guy. So they came to me, because I've been and I've been doing the weather now five nights a right. week. I said, How'd you like to be our backup sports guy? And I said, No. I said, What are you kidding? I said, I'm I'm a weather I'm starting weatherman. I'm a starter. Right. I'm not a backup guy. Yeah. So I went home and told my parents, you know. So they offered me backup sports. <laughs> don't, don't. You're a schmuck. Are you kidding me? That's all you ever wanted to do. They're giving you an opportunity. You're halfway between New York and Philadelphia, and you're going to tell them no. So I called up my boss, and I, I changed my mind. He said, okay. But then that was that was it. So that was um, like September, October 1986, and then February of 87, I was at Channel 3. I was at KYW. Right. And how long were you there? Five years. Five and, years. And uh, were, were you just a... Sports reporter there. Yeah, I was. I was sports reporter, weekend anchor. Okay. At that point, you know, th we had we had a five o'clock news, five thirty news, six o'clock news. We had yeah. ninety minutes worth of news. Was, and was Bob Bradley? Yeah, still he there? was. No, I replaced Bob Bradley. Did you? Did, he, did he, you know Bob? Yeah, he just I, passed I knew, away I not long did. ago. I knew him well. He's Actually, a sweet man. He covered the '84 USFL championship game, and he uh, was struggling with like. They had no crew down there. He had this huge trunk that he was trying to carry. And he was an older guy. At the right. Time, so so I actually helped him carry this uh, big trunk off the sweetheart. field. No, I mean, like, no, he, really. He, he, I was mean, one, he was one. He, yeah. He, uh, yeah, he was a great writer. The athletes were a little bit different back then than they are these You're days. You're right. But, You're right. You know. And he uh, he would uh, he would come in after he had, he had left Channel 3 full time. And uh, he would say, uh, it's only me. <laughs> Bob, how are you? So then you left, you, you were in Philly for a while, then you went up to Boston, right? Mm -hmm. You were sports director up yep. in Boston. Five years in Philly, met my wife at the end of my, our time in Philly. She's from Havertown. And um, we met, got engaged, moved to Boston, got married, stayed in Boston for five years. I anchored the, the 10 o'clock sports for WLVI. And uh, then I started doing radio, a little bit of radio. And at the end of that time, our daughter was born there. Emily was born there. And at the end of that time, um, we thought we were going to uh, stay there for the rest of our lives. We love Boston, and it was similar to Philadelphia, but different enough that it was like it's just a whole new world and a whole new life, and we were starting it out by ourselves. And But our family is important to us, and, um, you know, I was close to my folks, and Ellen was close to hers, and, and we were both close to each other's parents. So once Emily was born, we thought about, you know, if it's an opportunity to get closer, because we would still go go home, especially summers, go to Long Beach Island, and, yeah. and so it's a haul, you know, trying to get there, and traffic and all that, and, and, and um, so um, when Comcast started up, two of my closest friends in the business, Jim Cudahy and Tom Stathakis, with whom I'd worked at Channel 3, they called me up and said, you know, we're putting the band back together, you want to you wanna come back, mm -hmm. and um it was the toughest decision I ever made. Okay. It really was. And Ellen wouldn't give me any help. You know, she's like, if this thing goes bad, you ain't blaming me. You know, it's got to be your, de Big your decision. I mean, there yeah. was a, kind of a fledgling format at that time. Yeah. Really. And that was what? That was 1997. 97. So I had, been, I had been in Boston from uh, really end of July, 92, to uh, similar, you know, August, 97. And... Um, um, I mean, we just thought we were going to stay there the rest of our lives. So one day I was staying, the next day I was going, staying, going, staying, going, and and, and um, she really, to her credit, refused to help me. And finally, I said, "Okay, you know," I said, "We're leaving." And and they were up, they were upset at the, at the station. Um, they wanted me to stick around, and they said, "Okay, like, what do you want?" And I said, "Well, it would be pretty disingenuous of me to say 
uh, I'm, I'm leaving. How much? <laughs> and and so uh, I said, it's, it's it's really about. And they were then they, they started. You you you're going to the black hole of television. It's cable, man. You know, light goes in and does not come out. So uh, I I couldn't possibly explain what the opportunity could be, and and um, I I took it and. And I've never looked back. But I remember going to Jim Cudahy's house for dinner. Ellen and I met Jim. Jim is now at Masson at, at Mid-Atlantic Sports Network. They have the Orioles. Um, and Tom is at uh, Golf Channel. He runs Golf Channel. But I remember going to Jimmy's house for dinner. They opened the door, and they were so happy to see us. And I remember I just had this knot in the pit of my you know, stomach, just thinking, oh, this is the, it's not the right move. It's just not the right move. You know, we had a great thing in Boston. It was our own thing. And, you can never go home again, and all that, and and, and I was wrong, you know. Almost from, almost from the beginning, I saw what, and the Daily News came out with it, you know, the eight hundred gorilla, eight hundred pound gorilla that Comcast was going to Comcast Sports that was going to be, and 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 that's it's turned out to be uh, everything. Yeah, could you ever have dreamed it that it no. really would have been like this? No, nope. I mean it really. Comcast to me is the face of Philadelphia sports. It is. I mean, it really is. It is, yeah. and we're in the community. I think it's we're part of the part of the fabric of the community, and um, you know, sports is the lifeblood of this town. And I always say, you know, I said in a Philadelphia Magazine article that a couple months back, I, I say I, I always think we we define ourselves collectively by the success or failure of our sports teams. And when they're doing well, we got a little extra spring in our step. That's and when true. they're doing poorly, we're kind of got a little black cloud over our. We don't know why or why. Am I, I'm not in a good mood today. You know, Eagles lost, yeah. or the Phillies got knocked out of the playoffs, or, or whatever. And and um, so it's important to us. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I think it gives us all common ground, and that's that's tremendously important. You know, all the problems of today, they they all are on the outs. Most of them are on the outside with regard to sports, mm -hmm. um, economics, race, all that stuff, gender. You, you know. I mean, it's all, they're all on the outside. It's like sports is sacrosanct, and there's a purity there that there just isn't in society. Um, beginning when finally, you know, when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, what he went through. And now the only thing that matters is can you play, you know? And so, uh, and we, whether, whether you're white or black or Jewish or Gentile, it doesn't, whatever, it doesn't make a difference, you know? You know that, you got a team that you're rooting for, and you can all hang out, hang out around the water cooler and talk about it, which we do here, even at a sports network. Yeah, I can tell just from you know? my time downstairs. Yeah, oh, was, yeah. Was yeah. Yeah, I mean, either, either you're into it or you're not. This, this the screen turned black. I don't know if it's just screensaver on or, or what. It's not good, is it? Is it still running? It's still running. Yeah, we're still going. Um, you, I'm not blowing smoke here, but you have a characteristic that I have seen all very successful, not only broadcasters, but communicators have, and that is you, you have a talent for talking to the camera as if you were talking to me. Did you model that after anybody, or is it just something that, because you, you do see some broadcasters puff up their chest and deepen their voice, yeah. and it is a little disingenuous, right. but with you, it's like, you're no different talking with me here than you are on the camera. Yeah. I mean, that's that... the, and, and you know what, Ken? That's the biggest compliment I can get. Um, I, I, honestly, I mean, you don't think there's... You can go out, out in this parking lot that you could, you could... I bet you you could pick six out of ten people that know more about sports than I do. So, it's, I mean, it's not... In a town like this, it's not that hard, mm -hmm. you know? So it really is. It, it really is, is about how you communicate the inf information, how passionate you are about the information, right. how much you love what you do. Um, I tell my kids when I drop them off to school, I said, "You only got one chance to make today great. You know, make it great." And, and I said, "Because tomorrow, today is yesterday. So make it happen." And, and so you know, I, I I feel very fortunate to be able to do what I do, and and so. Um, I, I just try to convey that, and I don't know if it was if it was at Syracuse or w early days at Channel Three, but but someone did say you got to talk to that camera like there's someone looking through it on the other side, <clears throat> and Ellen always says, "Remember, you're talking to me," <laughs> and and, and um, 
and and some some nights it's like that some nights it's not like that but i always i always when i talk to the camera i always think that i'm talking to if not a person then one or two or three you know what i mean as a, if i was talking to a talking to a small group and i think that's important and that's television too that's the that's the intimacy yeah. of television and i think that's why television creates creates stars and you know, you were watching DNL today. We had Bobby Rigby on. Now, Bob 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 Rigby that was, was great, a that was great stuff. That's uh, that superstar. Is that? Yeah, do that you remember that? Well, absolutely. And I'm thinking, and, and no disrespect to Bob Rigby, but he finished right behind Lynn Swan. He's in a competition with Mike Schmidt, and I would think for my generation, he's like a household name. If you watch Superstars, you know the name Bob Rigby, sure. and he. He wasn't a football NFL player, and he w wasn't a major league baseball player, and yet you know he's a household name. That's because of TV. Yeah. And, and so when you when you're when you're on television, someone's in their underwear or their pajamas. That makes them feel about you like like the, I'm letting this guy in. No one else get you know. I got my husband or my wife, and I got this guy that's in the box right here, <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> and and. and um, you know, I, I think that I, I take that that part of it. I take real seriously. People let you into your homes. Yeah, you know, yeah. you, you it just is, it is a privilege. Really. Yeah, I mean, you got to treat them right. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the tennis. I, my some of my earliest recollections of you on TV were that U.S. Open coverage. Yeah. And you've had some interesting experiences with Barbara Streisand mm -hmm. and Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. Talk a little bit about <laughs> that. That's that's like my best and my worst. Uh, um, uh, I did the tennis for 18 years, from 1991 to 2008. It was an absolute blast. Um, uh, it, it just gave me, I always say the U.S. Open is like, it's like a mini Olympics every year because you've got athletes from all over the world and coaches from all over the world and fans from all over the world. In, in a city like New York, they just all descend every late August, early September, and, and they, have, they have this tennis tournament um, that's that's. Other than Wimbledon, I mean, the French has its charm, and Australian is a is a major also. But, but you know, you got Wimbledon, you got the U.S. Open, and to be part of that was was extraordinary. And and what what when I was hired by Gordon Beck, he said, I, all I want you to do is react. I want you to come. I want you to look at this whole event with fresh eyes, and I want you to just just report on what you see, enjoy yourself. Um, and initially, I think they, they were they were concerned that I couldn't handle interviewing the players because I didn't know as much about tennis. They wanted me to do more and more flavor. And I, I think that when they saw that I could handle that responsibility, all of a sudden the other reporters that they that they would have on on the crew that were that were like strictly tennis writers or whatever, they started to kind of fade from view. And I started to do more and more of of both things, both the feature stuff like Streisand and also the on court interviews. And so that was that became a real uh, trick to try to you know one minute I'm interviewing a celebrity the next minute I'm telling I'm being told go to court ten yeah. because the match is finishing up and you got to interview interview a player um, and, and it was it was it was amazing and also it's one of the only majors I guess the Australian they have night matches Wimbledon they don't the French they don't so so this is really the the Australians in the middle of the night so this is the only major out of Wimbledon and the French and the U.S. Open that plays night matches. And so the, the electricity of New York came into play there. And you have people, in some, some ways, some of the big matches, and I go back to like 1991 with, 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 with Connors. Um, it was his, if it wasn't his last Open, it was close to it. He was turning 40 or 41 years old. And he went to the semifinals. He lost to Courier that year. He beat Aaron Crickstein. Yeah, Sampras, yeah. Sampras had won either in 90 or, or 89, yeah. I'm not sure, as a kid. Yeah. Uh, um, and maybe Edberg might have won that particular Open. But, but um, there, were, there were many nights when it really had the feel of a prize fight. You know, you had two big names, usually, yeah. and, and uh, that electricity of the late summer in New York, yeah. there was a Christmas in the air many times. Sometimes it was steamy, and, and, and you would see the celebrities come out. You, no, did you just... Cold approach these celebrities, or yeah. did you? You didn't have any front guys up there saying, nope. "Mike, Some, talk to sometimes you? you know, at the, the 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 further along I got, and and obviously when they went from Louis Armstrong Stadium um, as the main stadium to Arthur Ashe Stadium as the main stadium, the stadium just got so much bigger at Ashe than Armstrong. So at Armstrong, you could you could case the place like that, and and uh, also in the broadcast booth, there was a guy in the broadcast booth. Who had a robotic camera, and he had the he had the, uh, the the instruments right here, 
and, and I would go up there and I could see what he was looking at and he would actually take the camera and scan every place and I would just look oh, Tom Brokaw hold it that's Tom Brokaw you know uh, there's it and, and um, wait hang on a second wait because I, I don't want her to leave wait wait pause we're pausing one moment uh, well um, so so anyway uh, just because I'm supposed to do this, the Sixers thing after. Um, wait, you, so the, you're rolling this thing like this is gonna? Is this gonna appear somewhere? We'll, we'll cut it. Well, uh, it's, oh. it, it's gonna. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll send you the file so yeah, yeah. you approve it, but it's, it'll, it'll appear on our website. Oh, I see. Yeah. I'm sorry, everybody. I didn't mean that. I, I had to go to a si the Sixers live, suite. We're live footage. right now, and uh, I, I have to meet them all. Um, can I can I have it in its entirety too? Of course. I'd lo I would really. I'll uh, say it all the time. I'd love it for for my kids. Sure. You know, because they don't listen to me now. <laughs> you know, I'm kidding again, children. Mwah. Daddy loves you. Now, okay, I, yes. Let's talk about this. I, mm -hmm. I I feel your frustration because I root for two professional teams: mm -hmm. the Chicago Cubs. Yes. From Chicago. Yes. And the Philadelphia Eagles. Yes. And your frustration on the post game show mm -hmm. at times is palpable. I mean, it's, yeah. and you're frustrated with the press conference, and you give some sarcastic barbs at times. Are, are you a frustrated fan when it comes to Andy yes. Reid and the Eagles? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, look, I've always been, uh, I've always been an Andy guy, um, because I think that it is such a crapshoot getting to the number one spot in whatever sport it is, whatever sport, to get to number one. You got to have luck involved, and to be as consistent as he has been. Um, and I heard Solomon Wilcox this morning with Angelo Cataldi on WIP, and Angelo was asking him. You know, and Solomon didn't know that Angelo had a predilection for you know getting Andy out, and and um, he he said, Shady McCoy. I mean, you talk about Andy Reid like ha having his voice fall upon deaf ears because play. He's only had Shady McCoy for three years. He's only had Michael Vick for three years. So there's turnover in these players. And as long as he's able to do it, then it's not falling on deaf ears because there's turnover. Um, um, that said, he, he, he really, people say, well, the, you think the Eagles can win the Super Bowl under Andy Reid? And I say, yes, 28 to 10, they can win. 28 to 24, I don't think they can. And, and he's just shown that to be the case. Um, and, and it's unfortunate because I'd love to see him win. Um, for, for the city and the fans, first and foremost, and certainly to validate what he set out to do. Um, and I think he makes it difficult at times to love him, mm -hmm. you know. But I say that as a member of the media, a fan as well, but I, I don't know if you're sitting at home watching him on post game or you're watching uh, Sportsnet at, at noontime for his news conference live. I, I don't know if you really care if the guy's a little surly, you know, if, if the guy is, is uh, you know, comes off like, like he's... Uh, a little gruff or a lot gruff. So I, I I don't know, but when I when I when I take to the to the air after those games, it's if they've lost. You know, as a bottom line, you say you're from Chicago. Steve Stone who was a you know great pitcher, and he did the Cubs games, and the Cubs were were floundering one year. I think he ended up getting whacked because of it as well. He said, "Don't don't tell me how rough the ocean is, boys. Bring the ship into port. Period." And 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 I feel the same thing. I don't know. Uh, uh, the, the, the nearly the amount of football you know, or Andy Reid, or, or the, the, those who are sitting on the set next to me. But I know, I know what I know, and I know when a team has a game that's there for the taking and they don't win. You know, I know that that then they should have. Uh, at the same time, I'm a, I'm a big Bill Parcells disciple, and um, you are what you are. He's oh, you are what they are two and four as we as we sit here now. They're two and four at the end of October, and that's what they are. Period. So. You know, um, so, so but but it is frustrating when I when I get on the air and they've lost in that way. At this at at the same time, when I see that they've done something great, or Deshaun Jackson fries the Giants with a punt return like he did, or McNabb did something against the Cowboys and they have a great Monday night win, and I'm all over that too, because uh, there's not that's that's the best part about Absolutely. sport. That's the best part about sport. So. Just, just to get stay on this uh, post game show for mm -hmm. uh, a minute, uh, Vaughn Hebron. Yeah, go on. Decision that management decision. Yeah, okay. management decision. Liked Vaughn, loved Vaughn. Um, you know, 
still friends, always be friends, and that's just one of the one of the deals in this business. Sure. And for and for that matter, uh, feel the same way about Trey. Does a great job, three time Pro Bowler, and and um, you want someone who can kind of get that's yeah, got some cred, cred yeah. knows what it's like in the in the locker room as well, yeah. and he does too. Tell me a little bit about the Harry Callis moment when he passed. I watched that on YouTube, and you had a visceral emotional reaction uh, that night on the air. Did you have a personal relationship with Harry? Did you were you mourning the loss of a Philadelphia icon? I mean, where did where did that? Come I think from? I was just mourning for all of us, and, and um, I live in Newtown Square, Delaware County, and uh, my address is. Um, <laughs> but boop. and and uh, I would see Harry. At, I call it my home Wawa. I have my away Wawa, which is in a different. But my home Wawa is right there, uh, off of two fifty two, in Newtown Square. And Harry didn't live, live far away. And and I would see him in the Wawa. And it would usually be not always off season. Sometimes it was during the season. And he'd shuffle in wearing his you know his white shoes and and um, you know we just shoot the breeze. And I and I felt worse for losing my friend from the Wawa than I did for, for losing my friend in the broadcast booth. Michael, how you doing? What do you think the boys will do this year? You know, he, he was, he, it, and, and he was always so approachable. But um, at the time he passed away, uh, it was spring break for my kids. We were, we were in Pittsburgh and Cleveland, and we were returning by van, uh, minivan. We're driving the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and I, and I got the word. And it's one of those things that, that uh, like, you don't – when you're watching a football game, you can't tell how physical it is from, from on TV or high up in the stands. But you go to the sideline, you can. Sure, you go to the yeah. sideline, it's like a car crash, a minute. And so when, the closer we got to Philadelphia, the magnitude of his passing, of his loss, started to get to me. And then, I'm, and then I had a, I, you know, I wasn't supposed to work that night. We were coming back from vacation. They said, we'd really like you to come in. So, and then the closer I got, I, I, I realized, oh, he, he's gone. You know he's gone, and there's a lot of people who grew up with him. And he was, as I said on on the YouTube, as I, he was the voice of our summers. Like listening to you know, uh, a steak frying on the grill, or listening to seagulls at the shore, or li listening to a pop, you know, can of soda opened up. You know that that was that was uh, he, he was part of the sound of all of that, and it's gone. His voice is silenced, and 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 I just I think the thought of that and the thought that collectively we're all going to be missing that. And I also thought with Harry that, that I never heard him, saw him in his heyday. I didn't see him in 1980, and I didn't see him in 1983. So I got to town in 1987, and so my wife did. And, and Rob Ellis, who works at IP now, who was my producer at the time here for Daily News Live, he had grown up with him. But I ha didn't see that, Harry, so there was, there was a little edge taken off. But I remember, uh, um, you know, the next season wasn't even that... that it was 09. We lost him 09. So it was like the next season in, in 10. And I just was saying, saying to my wife, and it's nothing, please don't leave this out. It means no disrespect to, to uh, Wheels or Tom McCarthy or L.A. or Scott Bransky or anything. I just said, I, you know, I said, I, I really miss Harry. I really miss him. There's a void there. And, and I, I, I don't know that I thought that that was going to happen because I, I kind of had known him from afar as a, as a broadcaster. I didn't really know Whitey. And I know what this how, how how much mourning we went through with with Whitey. We were in Boston at the time, and I remember, you know, watching a game, thinking, "Oh my God, I really miss Harry." Yeah. It's just you know, it's the way it goes. So it, it it just all hit me when we when we took to the air, and I realized that we're all gathered. The reason I am on the set at that time is because we're there to uh, you know honor the memory of a guy, uh, of a friend, everybody's friend who's no longer with us. Yeah. And it was it just hit me. Um, did you get in, into it with Marcus Hayes one time on the air? I read something about yeah. this, but did you have a little? It was way back. You know, uh, everything's fine with Marcus and me. Um, but he, he. I mean, I I always like to allow other people their opinion, and I think there's a way to argue. Uh -huh. And and at that time, it was it was like a death match, I think, for him. Um, and and so. You know, I just reached a point where I where I snapped. Was this off the air? It was on the air. No, it was on the air. I'll tell you what it was. It was it was the, uh, it was the, I think it was the Tuesday after, the Eagles, Super Bowl loss. So it was a like February something, 05. and and um, 
I don't re I don't even remember what it was now, Ken. I don't. But yeah. but it was it was something I just snapped out and and um, sports emotions. Coming yeah, out yeah. Of so so. Uh, but we're you know, we've been friends, pals. He went to Syracuse. I went to Syracuse, and um, it's all good. All right. As if you weren't busy enough, you took on another job here recently. Yes. Ninety four WIP. This just in. Mm -hmm. What do you do in your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was it, uh, obviously, they made you a financial offer. They you, made me an offer I couldn't <laughs> refuse, Ken. <laughs> but I mean, Tell you, you what. And you had a radio background, but I mean, you had to give that some thought. Because in, in interviewing Angelo and other guys that do the, the mm -hmm. daily sports uh, deal, it, it can be a grind. You're feeding the beast every day, trying yeah. to come up with new material. And I think the fact that you're doing both these things is a monumental effort. I mean, do you, uh, what, what, what made you take it on? I mean... Uh, well, I other than the financial gain, obviously. I one I, I <laughs> hang on. <laughs> I, I you know I w we had talked. Uh, I, Mark Rayfield is a long time friend of mine. Um, Andy Bloom, Angelo, uh, you know, Glenn, Anthony, Rhea. I mean, I've known them all. Al, I've known them all for. Uh, a long time. Angelo's always been great to me, and um, and we 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 always Mark and I. Uh, I've known Mark for twenty five years. We had always talked about working together, and and he, you know, he came to me and he said, uh, "How'd you like?" I'm thinking of shuffling some things around. You know, would you I be? Would a, ask him more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. People look at me like that was the swap, but really, it was. It's Glenn and Anthony moved into Howard's spot. <laughs> so so. Um, uh, so I said, sure, let me, let me, let me think about it. Um, it's look, I got a, I got a great gig right here at Comcast Sportsnet and, and this definitely adds more of the workload. I think it's in, in many ways, it prepares me more for Comcast Sportsnet because I've already gone through the, the studying and talking about the issues of the day on the radio by the time I get here. Um, and, and it's, it also even though I get to talk for an hour on Daily News Live, I still I still defer. You know, you're on the show. I'll defer to you, or, or Marcus, or Rich Hoffman, or whomever. So this is this is my show with with Ike. It's Ike's and my show, and so you can you just have. And even with that, three hours goes by fast. Did, did so, the management have any reservation at all? Here, yeah. no, uh, no. I, I I think I think because it was the right slot. Yeah. Um, they were okay. Yeah. Certainly, if they had asked me to do Angelo's shift, that would have been difficult. I mean, not Angelo's shift, but a, a morning shift, that would have been difficult. An afternoon drive shift, I, this is the only time frame that I could do. But you and, don't really don't have a whole lot of time. I mean, you know, you've got a few hours, and you have right. to come here and yeah. prepare. I, mean, I, okay. I get to the radio at 8.30 in the morning. Um, I drop my son or my daughter off, depending on the day at school. Um, I go to the radio station. I get there at 8.30. I go over all of the papers. I go through it. Ike comes in, Eric Golden, our, our producer, um, Turtle we call him, or I say Turt Tell, he, he comes in, we talk about, you know, themes that we're going to explore, and then we're off and running. And then the three hours goes fast. Right. Um, it, it goes fast. And I'm still learning it, you know, uh, I'm still learning it. Even though the visual component is gone, it's absent, there's still, you still need to know what you're doing from a radio perspective, and I, I, I don't know that yet. So I'm at this at the time of this writing, it's um, it's a month and a half. So, but it, but it's a lot of fun. And Ike's great. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor, quick laugh, and we're getting along great. Mm -hmm. So I don't and I, on radio, I don't know if that's a good thing, but I I have tremendous respect for him. We go back and forth. We had our first fight the other day on the air. It was really nice. Kissed and made up was beautiful, but so, uh, real, real no, 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 no. But, but you know, but I, I actually joked because they played the music when it was time to go to yeah. go to break. I said, "Not now. We're having our first fight." Are you kidding me? And he was talking about, "Oh, it was Donovan." Uh, uh, no, it was about Michael Vick. Why, why Michael Vick was brought here? And, and he contended that the Eagles thought all along that Michael Vick was going to be brought here to be the number one guy. And I said, "There's no way." Uh, so we went back and forth on that. And it was good. It was, it was really good. So, you know, you can disagree without being disagreeable, and I think that's the way it was, you know. Of all the years you've spent here at Comcast, who 
who's your favorite guy? Who who was your best interview? And who and who did you really not, you know, care for? Anybody in particular that, that comes to mind as far as a the guy you really wanted to have on, whether it was a personality or a reporter? Or no, I, you know, I, I get asked that all the time, and I really, I think in two thousand, the Republican convention was in this building, and. Um, we had uh, Ted Nugent on, the rock and roller, and he was absolutely insane. I, I, I saw that. Uh, oh, my that. God. Wanted to get Dana Panetto Neal naked in the woods and, and have, him, have her try his bow hunting school. <laughs> and and, uh, and then what you we, get for straying off the sports I thing. know. <laughs> then we had Larry King. You know, he was wandering by, and he came in the studio. Mitch McConnell. It was re really wild. Um who else? The only other, I mean, I'm not a big Nancy Kerrigan fan. I've never, but she came in, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't, I'm trying to remember when. Lillehammer was 2000, was, no, 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 1994. And she came in, uh, uh, and they said, don't ask about the, don't ask about Tanya, or don't, yeah. and I thought, I'm not, are you kidding me? So, but, yeah, so they, they got all. It was just this icy silence yeah. in the studio. Yeah. Um, other than that, no. We, you know, Tony Robbins was great. He came in, the motivational guy. Yeah. He came in with a little headpiece on. He, was, he had just gotten done juicing everybody up in the in the uh, in the arena. He didn't even realize he had it on. He was he was great. So uh, that was good. And uh, you know, I got to make a list, I guess. But we've had some great guests. But no, no, no. Uh, there's no one that really sticks out. And anything you want to add to the interview? Anything that uh, you no. want to say or haven't been asked? Or what, uh... No, I, I just I, I love being in Philadelphia. It's my home. I, I, I always, you know, uh, one of the things that always got to me, as much as I had, had a tremendous affection and respect for Tug McGraw, and I just talked about this on the radio the other day, when the Phillies, when it, it, it's our preoccupation with New York, you know, and I, I always, to me, it's like, who cares about New York? Are you kidding me? It's a great city, theater, you know, Broadway. Every, it's got nine sports teams. It's great. City that never sleeps. I love New York. It's fantastic. But relative to Philadelphia, when you're talking about a, a sports realm, who cares? And, and, and so when, I remember when, when Tug held that World Series trophy aloft, and he had, had, he had been with the Mets and won a World Series trophy with them. Uh, very early in his career, in 69, and he held up the World Series trophy. He said, hey, New York, look what we got, you know. Yeah. Uh, then? Right then? So, and the only reason I bring it up is because I, I and especially on, on Comcast Sportsnet and also on the radio, I, I just, I love this town. I love this, I, I think we're, we're such a great city, and, and I think we continue to show it every day, and, and uh, you know, maybe I'm a little Pollyanna-ish about it, but... But I don't care, you know. It's it's there's, there's just such there's so much negative out there, and that's why when people ask me, how can you have so much energy? How can you have so much passion? Do you wake up this way? No, I, everybody's got bad days. Believe me, you know. And the light goes off, and sometimes, you know, I walked into the radio today. It was raining. I'm like, oh man, it's raining. But but at the same time, I think about all the strife that goes on out there. With the, that that there are real jobs out there. That people are, you know. Paving roads, and, and, yeah, can't yeah, or you can't find work, yeah. right? Or, 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 or the work that they're doing, you know, we're, we're providing some kind of distraction for them. That I take real seriously, you know what I mean? So, so whether whether you're you're digging ditches or working on the roads, or you're a fireman, or you're a policeman, or you're a doctor, or a lawyer, whatever, you know, I, I'm thinking. I never had a medical degree, went to medical school, and I got doctors saying, I wish I could do what you do, you know? And, and so, that, that, to me, that's a tremendous badge of, of honor, yeah, you know? Sure. So, um, I'm, I'm happy to do what I do and do it here. Good deal. Well, this was great. I know you have great stuff. an event to run. Ken's got to go now. Ken's got... <laughs> I'll sit here and talk to you all. We'll night. see you soon. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>